perfect. No. Okay. Right. So, um, welcome everybody um, to the Polycon UK seminars. Uh, today we have uh, Peter Brusseret from Harvard. Um, he has a joint paper with Richard Moore Wilden, who's also here. And the paper is uh, Pandora's Ballot Box Electoral Politics or Referendums. Um, the format is the usual one. We're going to have uh, approximately 50 minutes presentation and then 10 minutes for questions. I think Richard uh, ought to be able to answer some questions in the chat if you want to ask questions in the chat. But uh, if you think you need uh, to ask a question during uh, Peter's talk, you can unmute yourself. Um, but if it's uh, maybe a question that takes a bit longer to answer, just wait until the end and we'll let you ask the question directly. Um, I just wanted to remind you that the meeting is recorded and that uh, in two weeks, uh, Mathilde Meillot from LSE is going to be presenting Learning to be Unbiased Evidence from the French Asylum Office. Okay, Peter, the screen is all yours. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation. Richard and I are really delighted to present this uh, work in progress on the electoral politics of referendums. So I probably don't have to convince the audience of Polycon UK that uh, direct democracy has been a pretty important part of policymaking for a really long time in many different parts of the world on a raft of issues ranging from participation in international agreements to social issues, uh, constitutional issues, and many more besides. But uh, the dominant perspective on uh, direct democracy within the literature has primarily focused on the normative justification for it, which was popularized in some work by Besley and Cote, who made the following argument. In a representative democracy, a politician has to make decisions on many alternatives, but a voter has to either take or leave the entire bundle. And that can lead to non-congruence on some issues if the majority cares more about some issues than others. So if I'm in the United States, and I want small government, but big gun control, I'm in a bit of a bind because uh, there's no one politician who can offer me both of those things. And the argument that Besley and Cote uh, advanced prominently is that by unbundling issues and pulling them apart and allowing voters to exert the majority will on a singular issue, that can be good for uh, improving the alignment between policy outcomes and voter preferences. And a literature building on and expanding on these ideas, uh, some of which preceded Besley and Coates' paper, tends to view direct democracy primarily, I would say almost uh, ubiquitously, as a tool or even a weapon that voters can use against politicians. And uh, Richard and I read these papers and following in particular the Brexit referendum, found ourselves thinking, why then uh, are politicians so fond of using direct democracy? Now, of course, there's a straightforward response, which is complementary to the unbundling argument, which is that there are certain kinds of issues that parties just do not like to have in elections. And a referendum is a nice way to ring fence those tricky issues away from the electoral arena, uh, especially when those issues cut across party lines. So for example, in the case of Brexit, uh, the conservatives you know, were hugely divided over Europe, perhaps more so at least prior to the referendum than Labour, this is the kind of issue that you really just want to get away. And the reason they work, this argument goes, is that referendums have this built-in commitment because to the extent that parties are obliged to fully implement direct democratic mandates, you're kicking the can to the voters, giving them the final word and ending the conflict. So the advantage of this is that you don't have your voters, your core supporters being distracted by tricky uh, issues like Europe or gay marriage, you can let the voters decide and get voters to vote on the basis of their party allegiances. Now, this probably raises a few eyebrows in the audience in the wake of uh, Brexit and in the possible run up to an Indy Ref 2. And I was told that there is the Scotland game going on right now, so I'm trying to be as topical as possible. We see uh, three problems with this argument. The first is that referendums can undoubtedly but also often fail to settle conflicts. And I can tell you all about many examples, but I'm just gonna put them up there and, and we can discuss them during the talk. So they often don't settle conflicts very well. Often it's pretty obvious that they were never intended to settle conflicts, but instead to project them into electoral politics. And 
If you believe either of those two points, then uh, I would contend that you are on the hook for our third claim, which is that referendums, in fact, don't commit policymakers. So there are lots of examples of politicians finding very clever ways to get around uh, referendums and the, uh, the outcomes of initiatives. And in fact, in our model, it will be true, but I think in the real world, it's true that if referendums really committed policymakers, they could never intensify an issue salience in an election because they would have to settle it. Okay, so this is gonna be an important perspective for us. And I'll come back to these specific examples later in the presentation. So what do we wanna do in this paper? We wanted to fill what we believed was um, a bit of a soft spot in the literature, which is to develop an electorally motivated theory of direct democracy. Our framework will have two parties initially. Uh, we probably won't get to it today, but we, we have results uh, for third parties as well. And there'll be two issue conflicts. A partisan issue conflict, which you can think of as the traditional issue that divides the parties, you know, big versus small government. And then there'll be an emerging issue. The emerging issue is going to be the object that potentially uh, we're uncertain about voter preferences, and we might be able to learn something from a referendum on that issue. On this emerging issue, we'll allow for divisions that are both within parties, but also across parties. And the role of a referendum is potentially to reveal shifts in public opinion on the emerging issue about which preferences will be uncertain. And in a way that I'll make clear, that revelation of information will shift and shape the policy commitments that the voters expect parties to honor. The questions that we wanted to ask with this framework are as follows. How would an office seeking incumbents value from a referendum depend on whether its partisan base is growing or shrinking? It's going to be a measure of its advantage or disadvantage in a traditional single issue election. Whether the second or emerging issue already uh, divides the major parties. So are the two parties already fighting over this second issue? Would we expect it in low or high partisanship contexts? And would we expect it to see it when divisions are more severe within one of the parties than they are across? And what's the third party gonna do to all of this? And then finally, we'll turn the framework to the classic questions that the literature is engaged with, which are the consequences for a notion of policy congruence. In our framework, do referendums actually serve the purpose that they are supposed to? The main answers are going to be as follows. So we're going to divide our analysis into two parts. We'll look at a framework in which we take the literature's presumption that referendums and direct democracy are binding devices. And this may be an answer to the question that Santiago has asked in the chat, which is, you know, why referendums are not just an opinion poll. We're going to treat the gamut. So we're going to think about referendums ranging from, you know, institutional mechanisms that force parties to do what the mandate tells them. And that's clearly different from an opinion poll. And then we'll remove that assumption. And in that environment, referendums will effectively serve as an opinion poll. Okay, so then in some sense, there's gonna be a spectrum of, of, of ways of thinking about referendums that we'll embrace. In a world where parties are committed, as the literature presumes, then indeed they'll work the way you'd expect them to. Parties that are divided on the second issue, in situations where there are divisions across the parties, will use the referendum to try and take the issue out of the election and refocus their partisan base on the unifying partisan conflict. They'll never be used to heighten the salience of that issue in the election. That's actually gonna be more of an assumption than a result. It's gonna be a technological feature of a binding referendum. There'll be an ounce of subtlety uh, in this because uh, partisan polarization can either strengthen or weaken the incentives to use referendums in this way but normatively, they'll do all the things that they should do. They'll improve congruence, both on the issue where the referendum is used and on uh, the issue which is not subject to a referendum, that is the traditional partisan issue, by helping to focus voters on the partisan issue and ensure that their usual party allegiances you know, are not distorted. Once we take away the commitment assumption, and I'll explain how we try to do that in our framework, things kind of go bad. Uh, or at least they get complicated. We'll show you that in addition to using referendums to take nasty issues off the table, 
Disadvantaged parties with a shrinking partisan base will also now have an incentive to use them in order to create what we call, you know, not uniquely us, but the literature calls a wedge issue to try and exploit latent conflicts of interest in its stronger opponent's base. We'll expect to see it in low polarization contexts and under a pretty broad ranging set of circumstances, referendums will do uh, horrible things to congruence. So they will tend to reduce congruence both on the partisan, i.e. traditional issue, uh, and even on the issue where the referendum is directly held. Okay, so they'll weaken the probability that policy outcomes on each of the two issues coincide with the majority preference. So the broader goal of the project is to kind of recast referendums, not as a weapon that voters use against politicians, but as a weapon that politicians use against other politicians. So with that, I'm gonna to go to our framework. We're gonna have two political parties called left and right, and we'll have two binary policy issues. One issue, which we call X, is gonna be your traditional partisan issue cleavage. So you can think about X equals one as the right-wing policy and X equals zero as the left-wing policy. And consistent with that, we'll think of right as being fixed at X equals one and left being fixed at X equals zero. There'll be a second issue conflict, the Y issue, again, binary. And this will be what we think of as the emerging issue. So leave versus remain, uh, legalized same-sex marriage versus not, et cetera, et cetera. We'll have a unit mass of voters and for tractability, we'll divide them into a fraction uh, mu of policy oriented voters. So these will be voters who evaluate the parties based on their platforms. And then we'll have a fraction one minus mu of so-called noise voters. And these noise voters will add some aggregate uncertainty into election outcomes. And we'll just assume that a uniform random draw eta of these noise voters just mechanically support right in the election. Mu will be a known parameter. Its value will not play a role in our analysis. So what are the preferences of our voters? So they've got to care about both the traditional issue and also the emerging issue. So each policy voter I will have a payoff type, XI, which is gonna be interpreted as which of the two partisan policies they like the most. And a B tilde I, which is gonna be a real number that describes how much they like Y equals one versus Y equals zero. So the payoff a voter gets from a policy outcome XY is gonna be P if she gets the policy on the traditional issue she likes the most. So if you're a conservative and you know, Boris gets elected, you get P. And if Jeremy gets elected, you get zero. Okay, so P is going to be a measure of partisan issue conflict. As P gets bigger, you care more about this partisan issue. And B tilde is going to be your net value from Y equals one versus Y equals zero. A fraction R of my policy voters will just have a preference for XI equals one. And we'll think of these as rights base or its core supporters. And the remaining fraction one minus R will have a preference for XI equals zero. These are your left-wing voters. And for simplicity, we'll assume that R is known. However, um, with small modifications, our results will go through. If R is stochastic, just replace R with its expectation. Now, what about the second issue? So we're gonna assume that the distribution of voters' preferences their net preferences for Y equals one, so you can think how much do I wanna do Brexit versus Y equals zero as remain, is gonna be party specific. So it's gonna be uniformly drawn with a support that varies across the parties. Let me just walk you through visually what's going on. What we wanna capture here is two things. The fact that there may be aggregate uncertainty about how all voters feel about the policy, but there may be also differences in the attitudes across parties. For example, conservatives, have always been more favorable to uh, leaving the European Union than the average Labour voter. So we'll assume that within the left party, BI tilde is uniformly distributed with a mean of gamma plus BL, whereas in the right party, it's uniformly distributed with a mean of gamma plus BR. So what is this allowing me to do? BL and BR are gonna be common knowledge parameters. And as I move BR and BL further apart, I'm making the parties more different in some sense in the distribution of their opinions. Gamma is gonna be a stochastic shock drawn from a support minus kappa to kappa 
with a symmetric unimodal PDF, and its realization will initially be unobserved. So as I, as I think about different realizations of gamma, I'm shifting everyone's preferences around, okay? And I'll remind you of this as, as we go through. Uh, Arda asks, hi Arda, yeah, exactly. So you, you can think of the party association as your XI type. So if your XI equals one, you're a right-wing guy. And if your XI equals zero, you're a left-wing guy, precisely. So what's the timing? Nature is gonna draw, draw gamma, which is this aggregate uh, shift in the, the location of all voters uh, preference types and eta, the fraction of noise voters that will support right in the election. Those realizations will initially be unobserved. Then we're gonna think somewhat uh, kind of abstractly of right as the incumbent party that has the option to hold a referendum on the second issue. And in any such referendum, we'll assume that policy voters vote sincerely for whichever alternative they like the most. Uh, the restriction to sincere voting is a meaningful one. Of course, we have a continuum of voters, so there's no question of best responses, but we're ruling out sort of coordinated action where voters try to influence the outcome of the subsequent election by uh, you know, voting insincerely on their preferences for the second issue. To us, this seems like the right place to start. Now, the only choice that will ever be made in this framework is whether to hold a referendum or not, and we'll evaluate it solely from the perspective of right trying to maximize its probability of winning. Now, lest, lest this seem unduly restrictive, let me just point out that there are two interpretations of this. One is the pure rapacious office seeking, maybe Boris Johnson view, I just wanna win and that's all I care about and I don't care about policy, my interpretation. Another interpretation, is that this could be an influential donor, say, uh, you know, the moneyed wing of the Republican Party, and they don't care about gay marriage or, or you know, some international treaty, but they really want to make sure that the right party wins office so it can implement its partisan policy of low taxes. And so uh, either of those two interpretations are consistent with this objective, because the only way that the party uh, policy X equals one can be implemented is if right wins. So after that, voters will vote sincerely in a general election, and the majority winning party will implement policy in a way I'll describe on the next slide. And I won't show them to you, uh, but we impose parameters such that the quantities that should be between zero and one are between zero and one. So we'll assume that, for example, if I can go back, this sigma is big enough that there's enough preference dispersion within parties. Uh, and we'll assume that R, the parameter that tells you the fraction of voters who intrinsically prefer right on the basis of its traditional policy, uh, we'll assume that's not too lopsided. It can be less than a half, it can be bigger than a half, it can't be too extreme. Can I ask two cl clarifications? Of course, yeah. The first one is pretty obvious probably, they maximize the probability of winning the election, right? They don't Correct, care. yes. Sorry, yes, yes, they're implied by its absence. Sorry, you're absolutely yeah. right. But more importantly, I'm guessing here that you have, a, if the referendum is not called, something happens such as they have to decide on the emerging thing, right? That's what's gonna drive everything. That's gonna be the next, the next slide, exactly. I'm gonna describe how policy is made. And again, it's going to be mechanical. I'm not gonna put it at the discretion of the, the party leadership. We are just gonna analyze a decision problem. Do I push this button and potentially reveal something about people's preferences on the second issue? And I'll tell, you the, I'll tell you that in just one slide. Um, and I, did you say you had a third one, third question, Francesco? Okay, so, so yes, absolutely. Let me, let me address that second question now. So how is policy gonna get made in this model? Parties are just gonna implement their basis majority preferred, in fact, in our framework, unanimously preferred partisan policy. So if Boris wins, it's always gonna be low taxes. Uh, and if, you know, if Jeremy wins, it's always gonna be high taxes. On the emerging issue, as Francesco said, you know, we have to say what happens if, if a referendum doesn't take place. And we'll just assume that the party mechanically implements whichever policy is most likely to be preferred by its core supporters. And I say most likely because in the absence of a referendum, Gamma's realization, the thing that's shifting around everyone's preferences has not been revealed to us. And that will turn out to be the expected majority preferred Y policy. 
So this could be micro-founded. You know, there are lots of ways you could do this. We think this is a pretty transparent way of doing it. You could imagine that there's some competition in the party and candidates have to converge on the expected majority preferred policy. Now, after a referendum, we also have to say what's going to happen. And we're going to look at two perspectives. The case where referendums are binding, meaning that whichever outcome wins a majority in the referendum, whichever party subsequently holds office just has to do it. This is the presumption of almost all existing work. Indeed, it's often viewed as the defining feature of a referendum. And later on, we'll consider a non-binding variation, uh, which I'll describe in due course. OK, so let's start looking at referendums with commitment. So there are countries in which referendums have a legally binding status, and perhaps there are political conventions that make it very difficult to, to wriggle out of them. This is the right place, I think, to start. So remember that voter I prefers y equals one if and only if her net value b tilde i is positive, and that value is uniformly distributed inside her party j. So what's the ex ante probability that a majority of members of j's base prefer y equals one? It's the probability that the median preference type in the party has a positive gamma plus bj, and we have a symmetric mean zero G, uh, you know, density of gamma. So if BJ is weakly positive, you think that your base, uh, the median member of your base wants to do Brexit. And if BJ is negative, you think they probably want to do remain. So absent a referendum, party J will be viewed as committed to Y equals one, if and only if BJ, which is a known parameter in this model, is weakly positive. Now, what does a binding referendum do? it mechanically forces the parties to converge on the second issue, which means that a subsequent election is gonna focus exclusively on a single partisan issue, in which case the fraction R of my mu policy oriented voters will support, right? You won't have to remember all of this, but I just wanna have it somewhere on the slide so we've seen it. Uh, and a uniform random fraction eta of my noise voters will support, right? What that means is that Wright's probability of winning in a single issue election is going to be an increasing function of R, the share of policy voters that like its policy of XI equals zero. So if the conservatives are kind of a 55% party, then they're gonna have the advantage. And if they're a 45% party, if the base is shrinking, they're gonna be at a disadvantage, but they could still win. Okay, so if, the BL and BR are negative, okay? So suppose that BL is less than BR and BR is strictly zero, strictly less than zero. The two parties' majorities and expectation already want to do Y equals zero. So before any election, the parties are effectively in a consensus, at least in terms of their majorities, they already converge. After a referendum, they're gonna converge anyway. It might not be on Y equals zero, it might be on Y equals one, but either way, the second issue is gonna play no role in the election. So immediate observation is that if BR is negative, a binding referendum will never change rights election prospects. I put it on the slide, but I just want to highlight, we'll assume throughout that BL is uh, strictly negative and that BR is weakly bigger than BL, but this will not uh, remove any interesting cases from our analysis. We'll be able to cover all of the context that, that you might want to see with this restriction. Okay. Now, what happens if the parties initially diverge, meaning that the average conservative already wants to go Brexit and the average Labour voter, who is also its median, uh, wants to do Remain? Now there's going to be some cross pressure. If I'm a member of the R party and I want to do uh, Y equals one, I'm as happy as a clam to vote for right. I want small government and I want out of Europe. Perfect. But I might be one of those right voters who actually wants to do Y equals zero uh, and now I face a pressure. Do I you know, pinch my nose and vote left, given that they're the party of, of Remain, or do I stick with the right party despite misalignment with the party's policy on the second issue? Well, as long as I don't care too much about the second issue relative to my partisan alignment with my preferred party, I'm gonna stick around. And that's this sliver of voters between, whose preference type is between minus P and zero. Similarly, you're going to have your, your Labour Brexiteers, if you like, who are going to have the same cross pressure, and we're going to be able to get a fraction of them to stay in proportion to the size of P. And remember that P is, you know, the net value that you get from your most preferred partisan policy. So P is kind of shifting the relative salience of these two issues for voters when those two issues are on the table. 
So, you know, we can write down a condition uh, for right to benefit from a referendum when the parties initially misalign. And notice that, or, or let me just assert, um, that this expression highlights the bundling logic that I described earlier. If I were to set P equals zero in this expression, we would be looking at the fraction of voters that just want to do Y equals one. But because we have this P strictly positive, uh, the set of people who vote conservative is not equal to the set of people who want to do Brexit. It's, you know, some people, you know, people who want to do Brexit modulo uh, some members of the left party, uh, and also you're losing some members of the right party as well. And so this bundling logic is, is embedded in this framework. And what do we show? Nice clean benchmark, or at least hopefully clean. If the parties initially misalign on the second issue, a binding referendum will benefit right if and only if the size of its partisan base is big enough, meaning its advantage in a single issue election is big enough and big enough relative to some parameters. So if we just eyeball this figure, I told you that this is BR ranging from BL all the way possibly to minus BL and beyond. Referendum plays no useful role when BR is negative. We were in consensus before, we're in consensus afterwards. When we were initially in disagreement, it seems as if this threshold above which I wanna do the referendum is an increasing function of BR. And it also looks like it hits a neutral 0.5 when BR is equal to minus BL. So what's going on with that? Here I'm showing you the distribution of types inside part ER for any realization of gamma. Now you can convince yourself that the net share of members of the right party that like Y equals one is equal to, you know, the red line minus the blue line divided by its length, which just happens to be this guy. And this guy is the preference of its median or average type. So the net share of R's base is proportional to the intensity of its average member's preference. So how do we interpret this? We interpret it as the party's cohesion on the second issue. So if gamma plus BR is very close to zero, it means that the party is basically 50-50 split. It has a slight majority in favor of Y equals one, but it has a large minority of, if you like, remainers who really don't like that policy and are a potential flight risk in a multi-issue election. As gamma plus BR is getting bigger and bigger, the party's majority in favor of Y equals one is going from 55% to 65% and so on. And that unity is a source of electoral advantage. We could do the same exercise for the L party. Remember that gamma plus BL has to be negative in a, in a divided election. And if you eyeball this for long enough, you'll see that the net flight risk across the two parties, ex ante, is going to be equalized when the size of each party's majority in favor of its majority preferred policies are equalized. So when 60% of conservatives ex ante want to do Brexit and 60% of Labour voters want to do Remain. The worst situation to be in in this model and we think in reality is where, you know, labor is 70% remain, but the conservatives are 51% leave. The size of your minority faction is, is, the, is kind of a measure of your risk. So indeed, when BR and minus BL coincide, the second issue is kind of net neutral in the party's relative fortunes. And that's why you end up with the neutral benchmark of R equals one half. Now, if BR is less than minus BL, you're pretty vulnerable in a multi-issue election. And even if you think that your base is not looking too good in a single issue election, you might still be better off trying to settle the score um, because you're especially vulnerable on the second issue. And conversely, if BR is bigger than minus BL, then you actually don't wanna settle the issue because it's a net source of inflow from the other party's base relative to your own losses. Okay, so the takeaway is, as you would expect, with commitment, referendums are going to be used to take the divisive issue off the table. I did tease this in the introduction, so I feel I, I ought to justify it. What happens if, for example, polarization increases? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on comparative statics, because I think they're sort of second order, but just to highlight, it's an intuition that's useful. When polarization on the traditional issue increases, you're kind of increasing the loyalty of say conservative remainers who are thinking of switching sides. Okay, so you're getting this interval minus P zero to get bigger. And likewise, the left party is also holding on to more of its Y equals one types. Now, because the density is uniform, 
uh, the party that's going to net benefit from this insurance is going to be the party whose base is bigger. Uh, and thus, if R is bigger than a half, the conservatives are net benefiting from an increase in polarization in a multi-issue election. And if R is less than a half, it's the left party that's net benefiting. They're just holding on to more people with an increase in P than the right party. So if BR is bigger than minus BL, so that my threshold R is larger than one half, an increase in polarization is actually going to discourage the right party from holding a referendum because it's actually doing pretty well now thanks to the loyalty of its relatively large base. But if you're the ex ante weak party, you're already more worried about stealing your opponent's core supporters, which you've got to do if you have a hope of winning. And an increase in P is just putting your opponent's base further out of reach in a multi-issue election. So it actually intensifies your value from taking that issue off the table. Okay, so now we're gonna to turn to the, you know, I think kind of more realistic uh, context, which is referendums without commitment. So let me just start with a, a quote from the most unlikely sage of Brexit, Nigel Farage. So Nigel Farage made a comment in May. You can tell this project is a bit of a catharsis for us. Uh, so he said in a 5248 referendum, this would be unfinished business by a long way. If the Remain campaign win two thirds to one third, that ends it. So saith Nigel Farage. What happens? Well, Leave wins in a 51.89 to 48.1 referendum a month later, and all of a sudden it is the greatest democratic mandate that you know, the world has ever seen. Okay, so this sort of stimulates our thinking about what's really going on in referendums. And more generally, there are lots and lots of examples of politicians uh, finding clever ways to work around direct democracy, re referendums and initiatives. So, you know, in California in 2010, then Attorney General candidate uh, Kamala Harris divided with her opponent Steve Cooley over whether she would defend a legal challenge to the ballot initiative Proposition 8, okay, and, you know, which was anti-gay marriage, and she said she wouldn't, and he said he would, and uh, she won, and the measure was not defended. In 2018, you may have heard it was controversial at the time, Florida had an initiative that would allow convicted felons to vote, and the Republican legislature passed enabling legislation with a kind of poison pill that said they had to pay off their debts first, so it, you know, it weakened the substance of the, the ballot measure significantly. The Treaty of Lisbon was a, a sort of effort to uh, repackage the European Constitution project, which had encountered tough times in French and uh, I believe Dutch referendums uh, a few years before. In Brexit, you know, for three years and two general elections, the big fight was about who could be trusted, quote unquote, to deliver Brexit. And in Colombia in 2016, the government's peace agreement with the FARC floundered, and it just passed it legislatively after some renegotiation without further voter consultation. And, you know, I think Brexit especially illustrates this point and it's gonna motivate how we try to capture it in our framework. So of those who had voted conservative in the 2015 election, i.e. the year before the referendum, 61% had voted leave. The pretty sizable majority of conservative voters wanted to leave. Of those who had voted labor, 65% voted remain. So the party's majority is clearly misaligned with each other. And 2019 labor deputy at the time, Tom Watson, kind of laid it bare when he said, the simple truth is, whatever anyone says, Labour is a Remain party. He said this at the party's conference. And, you know, voters took note. And in the 2019 general election, amongst many other things that were going on, 52 of the 54 Labour constituencies that ultimately uh, swung Conservative happened to be Leave voting constituencies. So this kind of motivated us to try and capture a, a no commitment assumption, see how that affects our results. So we modify our benchmark by assuming now that whether a referendum takes place or not, parties will just implement their supporters preferred platform. Now, why is that gonna shake things up? Well, quick bit of referendum accounting. In a referendum where voters vote sincerely, which they do by restriction in our framework, we can write down the total vote in favor of y equals one, and that's gonna to correspond to a threshold realization of gamma. Remember, gamma is shifting the uh, position of all voters around the, the, the policy space. Okay, so gamma has to be big enough, in particular this thing, but a majority in party J prefers y equals one, if and only if gamma is weakly bigger than 
in this case, minus bj. And what I want you to notice, because I'm going to show you a picture on the next slide, is these two uh, thresholds obviously don't coincide. So henceforth, we're going to assume that kappa, which is the largest in absolute value possible realization of gamma, is big enough that in principle, either party's majority might want to do either y equals 1 or y equals 0. We don't have to impose this, but it's the cleanest case. So what can a referendum now do? It will indeed be the case that a referendum reveals the realization of gamma. So that's, that's actually a consequence of our framework. So if you tell me you know, how many people voted leave, I'll be able to back out gamma in this framework. That's going to shape the party's policy commitments. So if gamma is really big in absolute value, if it reveals that even the conservatives have suddenly become ardent Europhiles, the referendum is going to settle the issue as if it had been a binding commitment. Both parties will be known to be committed to y equals zero. If gamma is so large that even you know, the most ardent uh, Europhile, you know, Andrew Adonis turns out he actually wants to do Brexit, leave immediately, then the party's platform commitments again will reflect um, the majority preference in each party. What happens when gamma is realized to take an intermediate value is that the party's majorities are going to misalign. And in fact, if you eyeball this long enough, you'll see that a referendum outcome, and this is why, you know, paradoxically, Nigel Farage's quote was quite prophetic, uh, a sufficiently close referendum will indeed in this framework always induce a multi-issue election by revealing misalignment of the party's majorities and thus shaping the policies that the parties are expected to implement if they win. Okay, so what can a referendum do now? Well, uh, if we don't have a referendum, suppose that the party's majorities initially align in favor of y equals zero. No referendum, single issue conflict. Now, if I have a referendum, we might still have a single issue conflict. Okay, the referendum might resolve the issue, reveal what we needed to know and take care of business. But it could now trigger a multi-issue election where before there could not have been one. Okay, if we were in a commitment world, this box would be you know, blue and it would say single issue. So the fraction of policy voters that are now going to vote um, for y equals 1 in the referendum, so this is the same object I showed you before, is going to be not the same as the fraction that actually support right in an election. Again, because the election is going to rebundle what the referendum was supposed to pull apart. So in particular, the set of policy voters that actually prefer to vote right is going to be the set of voters that prefer y equals 1 plus this additional term which is going to be positive if R is bigger than a half, because the, you know, the right-wing party is going to get you know, Brexiteers, but also um, you know, hold on to relatively more of its remainers who are loyal to the party. And if R is less than one half, then uh, the Conservatives are actually going to be losing relative to the fraction that prefer Brexit. Okay, so this is really our, our take on the failure of the unbundling argument as soon as you yank the commitment carpet out from under, many, under, the, you know, under the feet. Of course, there are lots of different ways that you could think about relaxing the commitment assumption, but more or less, we, we think that this is a pretty uh, you know, robust phenomenon. So now you know, we can write down a condition for right to benefit from a referendum. And what I want you to notice is that BR and BL, uh, about which we haven't said too much so far, Okay, so BR is kind of the expected, uh, you know, preference type in the right party, and BL is the corresponding expected type in the left party. It's going to have two effects on this net value. So first of all, conditional on finding ourselves in this bin where we have a multi-issue election, changes in BR and BL are going to affect the relative unity of the two parties' bases in ways that we've we've discussed already. So conditional on being in a conflict. You want, if you're in the right part, you want BR to be as big as possible because it means you have a more cohesive majority within your party. But changes in BR and BL are also going to affect the probability that you end up in this bucket. Okay, and we have to sort of keep track of both of those things. So what do we show? We show that if BR is negative, there's going to exist some threshold, R star, it's going to be weakly less than one half, uh, such that a referendum benefits right if and only if it's partisan base is sufficiently shrunk in the sense of being less than this threshold. So what is this telling us? It's telling us if you're an advantaged party, you don't want to do this. 
Okay, a multi-issue election is always going to weaken your prospects. It's going to confuse your voters, get them to start voting on second issues that are just a distraction from, you know, small taxes and small government. Don't do it. A multi-issue election, or the prospect of it, may help the minority party by offering a new avenue for dividing its stronger opponents, core supporters, but it also seems like it doesn't always help. So why is that? The reason is as follows. When you trigger a referendum from a position of initial cross-party consensus, you know that the referendum is only going to impact the election when it reveals a gamma between minus BR and minus BL. These are both positive numbers if the party's majorities are initially in alignment. Now, I told you earlier that the relative size of a party's majority internally in favor of its majority preferred policy is proportional to the absolute value of BJ plus gamma, the preference of its average member. So if gamma is drawn very close to minus BR, as it could be, this thing is going to be very close to zero, meaning that the referendum is going to ultimately reveal that right is a very divided party. This is going to be zero, meaning that it's a 50-50 split inside the party. If gamma is realized very close to minus BL, it's going to reveal that left is actually the relatively divided party. But G is decreasing. Okay, So shocks that are closer to minus BR are more likely than shocks close to minus BL. In, you know, intuitively, if the parties initially align on this issue, it's pretty unlikely that a referendum is going to reveal a fissure between the two. But when it does, it's much more likely to push the Conservatives into a very small Brexit majority than it is to swing a huge chunk of Labour supporters into a very large Brexit minority. So what that means is that the right party recognises that this is a very desperate gamble. When you do this and it does what it's supposed to do, it's relatively likely to show that your own base is hopelessly divided, which really sucks when you're the minority party, because the only way to win is by you know, stealing enough of your opponent's base and holding on to enough of yours. So only a badly trailing party is going to want to gamble. Now, uh, uniform G is consistent with our modeling assumption. And if the density is flat here, then the threshold R star is identically equal to one half. So just a, a comment uh, there. So if G is uniform, the threshold is exactly one half. Now, what happens if we are in a uh, initially in a multi-issue referendum, excuse me, a multi-issue election? So suppose that instead BR is initially positive. So the parties are already kind of duking it out on this issue and right is deciding whether to use a referendum potentially to settle the issue. Well, now the referendum may settle the issue, but it may also fail to do so. And again, we can write down uh, you know, the value to the party from using the instrument in this way. And we come up with our next result, which says that if the parties initially misalign on the second issue, there will exist another threshold, R star, such that the referendum will benefit right if and only if R is bigger than R star, which was also true in the case of a binding referendum. And here, excuse me, I've plotted the blue line above which you wanted to hold a referendum in the commitment case. And the same is also true in the no commitment setting, but clearly there's some difference. And the intuition is that if the right party is initially very divided, you know, the referendum is likely to reveal uh, values of gamma that unify the party's majorities when gamma is very uh, low and negative and thus your party is super misaligned with the preferences of voters. So it's likely that you know, the conservatives are banging on about Europe, but actually most voters want to stay in. If BR is bigger than minus BL, you anticipate that it's very likely that your opponents kind of got the wrong policy and is, is misaligned with a large swathe of voters, and that's going to diminish your relative urgency from taking the issue off the table. Okay, so broad, more or less, you know, let me just say, things work somewhat similarly in the case where the parties are initially misaligned, um, but, but there are some, some differences. So given the time, let me, let me just make a couple of comments uh, about the other stuff that we look at in this paper. So that's, you know, that's our benchmark framework. So now we ask, you know, do referendums in this framework uh, improve the congruence between policy outcomes and voter preferences? So existing work, I'm just gonna be a little, uh, you know, blunt and say almost universally with important exceptions, the answer is yes. 
and various work argues that it can improve congruence on the issue subject to direct democracy, but even on issues that are not directly subject to direct democracy. So we'll say that a referendum strengthens congruence on an issue if it raises the probability, ex ante, that the majority prefer policy on that issue is implemented. Observation, it does not deserve the status of a proposition because it's so, you know, somewhat trivially obvious. A binding referendum always strengthens congruence on both issues. I mean, you're revealing the necessary information about the realization of gamma that allows the parties to bend their platforms to the majority preference. So that on the second issue, you've got to be making things better. And by taking the second issue off the table to the extent that it's already on there, you're helping voters come back to their parties, vote on party lines, and thus whichever party has uh, the partisan advantage is now more likely to win. So taking the second issue off the table also helps realign uh, outcomes on the first issue. So that's great, wonderful. Unfortunately, it's not so true when we yank commitment away. So if the parties initially uh, align on the second issue, meaning that referendums are only a tool for disrupting consensus, non-binding referendums always weaken congruence on the traditional issue. For the simple reason that, you know, by raising the specter of a multi-issue election, you're now going to have some voters abandoning their traditional parties to vote on the basis of the second issue, and that raises the probability of kind of a partisan mistake. More surprisingly is that there are circumstances, which are highly complementary to when we predict referendums will be used, in which uh, non-binding referendums even weaken congruence on the second issue. Okay, so they can, they can make things worse. Uh, I won't go through the intuition because I want to make sure I finish on time, but th this is sort of a, uh, you know, something we think is uh, important. Now, when the parties initially misalign, you might think, well, you know, the, of course, referendums have to make things better there. You know, the problem is already on the table when the parties are fighting over this thing. And indeed, um, a non-binding referendum will strengthen congruence on the second issue if the parties initially misalign. At worst, it won't solve the conflict, and at best, it will resolve the conflict. So that's going to be fine. However, it turns out, and again, I won't go into details, that they can still mess things up on the traditional issue, which is surprising because the traditional issue, you know, partisan alignments are already in jeopardy because of the presence of a multi-issue conflict, and yet referendums can still make things worse. Details in the paper. Finally, because if we didn't, you know, we would be extremely vulnerable to some obvious criticisms. I mean, we may also be, but, but in particular on this question, we expand our analysis to consider third parties. And all I'm going to say is, to summarize in a, in a couple of minutes, it's, it, it may seem obvious that from, say, the conservative perspective, getting rid of UKIP is the only problem that they have to solve. But in the no commitment setting, it's not totally obvious that that's right. And here's a glimmer of an intuition. Prior to a referendum, both Labour and Conservative are, are losing some of their core supporters to UKIP. Now, the Conservatives are losing more, uh, both because UKIP is more aligned with the Conservatives on traditional policy. You know, they both want to send all young people to jail, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas for Labour, there's this P uh, obstacle that, that, you know, so some Labour voters are, are going to be a little unwilling to vote uh, UKIP, even if they're very pro-Brexit. And also, there's just more Conservatives that want to do Brexit in the first place. However, if the referendum reveals a realization of gamma that puts labor and conservatives at loggerheads, things go a little bit haywire because uh, from the conservative perspective, you're getting back some Brexiteers who you'd lost to Nigel Farage, but now you're losing some remainers to labor. And you might not be getting a compensatory drop of Brexiteers from labor coming over to your side. Whether you do is gonna depend on primitives. And so let me just say, we provide a pretty uh, tight uh, characterization uh, under lots of structure, because you have a lot of degrees of freedom here, uh, to highlight how sometimes if, you're, if you think you're the strong party, which perhaps you know, they thought they were the dear conservatives back in 2015, it might not be ex ante the right thing to do to hold a referendum. Sometimes it's better to hunker down and just hope that your large partisan base can afford to lose a few Brexiteers uh, rather than opening up Pandora's box where now you're losing lots of voters potentially to labor. So that's, that's kind of what we flesh out in the paper. So 
Let me just say, this is you know, a very stylized model, of course. We think we're entitled to do it because we, you know, we think it's a you know, somewhat different perspective and we want to be transparent about our thinking, but we do leave many avenues open for further research and we want to acknowledge at least some of them. The first is that direct democracy is often used to mobilize turnout in the US especially. You know, there was a lot of talk in 2004 of Karl Rove wanting to put you know, anti-abortion referendums on the presidential election ballot to whip Republicans to show up. Um, that's disputed, of course, but, but there's a lot of that going on at the state level. Uh, we do have a small extension that covers that uh, case. Our treatment of information and preference aggregation is truly blunt, okay? Referendums magically reveal information. I mean, they do it, you know, it's not an assumption, it's, a, it's an implication, but it's a very hardwired uh, fact. And of course, in practice, referendums often, you know, don't reveal uh, necessarily all the facts of public opinion and their subtleties. Maybe the referendum questions are posed in open-ended ways that confer lots of discretion. But if you think that's true, it's probably going to be complementary to our perspective, because it's going to make it easier for parties to do whatever the hell they want after the referendum. But, but you know, papers should be written that deals with that issue more subtly. And the final point, which we also say nothing about, but which I think is important, is that referendums often degenerate into beauty contests over whichever politician got behind the yes campaign. You know, David Cameron, ex post foolishly and possibly ex ante as well, staked his career on a particular referendum outcome. Think of Matteo Renzi, okay? So politicians just can't help but attach their name to a particular side and then they get screwed. And we don't have anything in the model that speaks to that, although I have some thoughts. Uh, you know, we have some thoughts about how that could happen. So I'm out of time. Let me just thank very much the organizers. Here's a bunch of related papers and apologies if I've missed any out and I hope you'll tell me about them. And we, we're very grateful to you all for your time. Thank you. Sorry, I have a, a laptop and my mouse sometimes doesn't respond quickly. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter and Richard. Uh, it's quite lively in the chat. Um, my impression is that Richard handled it, but um, if anybody who asked questions um, in the chat would like to, you know, um, continue the conversation, please unmute yourself. Um, I mean, anybody who has questions, really. Um, if nobody has hi, a question. Uh, oh, go on, go on, no, come no, on. Come on. Are you sure? Okay, thanks. Yeah, go on. Uh, hi, Peter and Richard. Hey, come so, on. yeah. Just going back on that um, that comment I had about constitutional reforms, what I one thing I had in mind was this um, constitutional reform in France in the 2000s, which voters didn't seem to care too much about. The turnout was very low, but it helped a little bit. The final point you made to sort of be a beauty contest about the popularity of the incumbent, and maybe that that's the only reason they ran the referendum to learn about this. Uh, knowing that it was an issue that voters didn't really care about. So whether they voted on that issue or not didn't matter, but just to generate information. Uh, so it, it kind of goes with your model, but it would be a case where you attach very low value to the policy and yet it's valuable to run that referendum. I, I agree. And as you say, like we, we don't have that feature. You could imagine, I mean, you could go, one route that you could go if you wanted to really take this point seriously is to imagine that Maybe the politician has some private information about which alternative is right. Um, I, I tend not to trust that perspective, uh, you know, given my my you know national heritage. But it, you might think so, and then of course uh, your belief in their quality of their information could impact in ways that you know we can obviously think about. But yes, uh, more realistically, probably you know there's just some sense in which incumbent valence is tied to their decision to prioritize the referendum. And they just get mixed together in ways, especially if it's a low stakes referendum, in which case my suggestion probably isn't you know, necessarily the, the right one. So uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, apparently in Italy, there are so-called abrogative referendums. Uh, I was just looking at your comment in the chat as well, where if you, if you kill something, then there's a vacuum that has to be filled again. And that would also be an argument in favor of our no commitment perspective, because simply killing the status quo uh, leaves open the question of how that void should be filled. Um, well, that was pointed out to me. Uh, having, <laughs> uh, I'm going to claim national knowledge here. Uh, it, it's um, so in Italy, referenda, when you go and vote, there's literally uh, pieces of legislation that are written down. And sometimes it's written down that occupies a whole page. And there's 
literally words from the legislation that get canceled. It's a bit like a line item veto that you do. Mm, so okay. it, actually, it actually is quite predictable what will happen is that sometimes um, what does happen is that the, the outcome, uh, especially if it's an electoral law that gets changed through referendum, is something that nobody likes. And then because you know, you can only do so much by canceling lines and words and prepositions mm. and everything. So then uh, there is a bit of a vacuum that people want to okay. want to do. Actually, my favorite example of known commitment to in Italian referendum is that many years ago, Ariana won't remember this because I'm not sure she was born when this happened, but um, uh, Italians voted to abolish the Ministry of Agriculture. They had a reference. So what the government did, they set up a Ministry of Agricultural Policies instead. So that that tells you something about commitment devices. I mean, by law- it Sounds I mean, like Rick Perry's deepest uh, dream in the US. He would love to do that, um, yeah. Well, because, you know, nobody was quite sure what would happen then. <laughs> well, so they just took literally the same building, they changed the, you know, they changed the, wow. the headings on paper and so on, and they just set it back up. <laughs> Goodness. Goodness. Yeah. yeah, I was told there was an example of, 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 of uh, same-sex marriage, which required the abolition of uh, something to do with marriage in order to replace that piece of... Uh, so someone was telling me from the 80s, apparently this also happened. Yeah, no, so um, referendum at the beginning were very important. In Italy, basically divorce and abortions are legal because of referenda. They, um, they were major battles, but then the instrument um, there's this uh, signature requirement that you have mm. to collect so many signatures to her, became a little bit abused and, and the, the number of people who went to vote decreased over time. And I see. what happened in the end was that most referendums failed because they didn't reach a quorum, right? You need at least yep. 50. You know, if you want to vote against it, you know, if you're against the referendum, you, you don't go and vote, basically, which mm -hmm. biases things against uh, winning the referendum. So almost nothing passed after that. Um, I'm not even, I'm not too much on top of it anymore, but um, seems to be going on right now. Okay, anybody else who wants, Max, you had a question. Right? <clears throat> um, yeah, I had a question about this assumption you had that it's the one party that has the power to call the referendum. Right. And then the issue is also given. So, so this is the, the second dimension. Um, it seems to me that in, in, in those, you know, in your model, the essence of your model is that uh, this is a political tool in fighting elections and maybe used in that way. In that, if that's the case, then the natural question is what if both parties can deploy uh, a call for a referendum, you know, whether it's, it's realized or not, it's a separate issue, but it seems to me. So first question is, um, it seems to me that this is a pure conflict. So if one party prefers, the other That's one correct. automatically doesn't prefer. So, you know, how That's do we address correct. that? Yeah. And the second question is, what if this, you know, the issue can be selected? So perhaps, I don't know, gamma. So mm -hmm. suppose parties have an insight into what gamma is and then selecting the one that actually favors them. But obviously then the model is different because it's not about revealing ga gamma, I guess. So any comments? That's about? yeah, that's absolutely right. So your intuition is is spot on. This is a zero sum game, and so when right wants to call a referendum in this model, left does not. Um, so that's that's exactly right. Of course, uh, there are lots of other things. So in, you know, other things that we could add to our list is we could consider the incentives of one of the factions inside the parties, where we think of them, you know, probably as being policy motivated, and then it's going to get you know, that's obviously not going to be true anymore and things could get uh, interesting. And, you know, you could also think a bit more explicitly about politicians putting their name to a particular alternative. So, you know, it was a, it was great for the conservatives, but a pyrrhic victory for David Cameron because he had attached himself to one of the outcomes. So we could, we could think about doing that. And we, 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 maybe we should, because we've been encouraged to, um, that would get away from the zero sum logic. And then you're absolutely right that, in practice, you know, there may be a, a suite of issues, a menu that parties can pick. And broadly speaking, if parties can pick, you know, putting aside the signaling considerations that by choosing to go on the issue, the parties are telling voters something about gamma and then voters have to update, putting those issues on one side, they're going to want to pick the issues that, you know, are relatively uniting for them and divisive for their base. And more or less, uh, my sense is 
it's 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 often not totally unclear what those issues are. Although, you know, one of the pathologies of Brexit was it revealed far more equivocation um, within the Labour Party over this issue, and thus paradoxically turned the Achilles heel of the Conservative Party into uh, its greatest weapon, uh, precisely because it it told us oh, things are a bit more ambivalent in Labour than we thought. So, so that that's my broad answer. You know, now of course there are other ways that you can write this model. So if you want. You could change the, the, the interpretation of gamma and treat it as a preference shock that's, that's drawn when a referendum is held and think of gamma as being, you know, the vicissitudes of the referendum campaign. And in fact, in our stylized model, our propositions go through. That was the version we originally looked at. So there are lots of ways that you can retool gamma um, to, to try and make some progress in that direction. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. I think one point I'd make about uh, gamma is we've sort of made the most favorable assumption to referenda. Here, it's basically what a referendum does is it reveals policy like uh, payoff relevant information to everybody, and and so it's sort of it it it's, seems like the, the the best thing you could imagine a refer a referendum. <clears throat> We still find cases where, because of the the multi dimensionality, it leads to uh, it leads to worse outcomes. So it's um. That's right. I mean, our focus is kind of what happens afterwards. And so we do not problematize the things that are problematic about learning about about gamma being a bit coarser and so on and so forth. Okay, I'm going to um, stop the formal part of uh, the seminar. I, I just wanted to thank uh, Peter, Peter and Richard again. Thank you very much for uh, thank you. this presentation. It is very topical, of course. So Thank you very much for um, being with us. Um, we'll see everybody in two weeks, but if you wanna stick around, 